clear. A good morning, first and foremost, to uh, all who are here via live as well as through our live feed. Um, it's my esteemed pleasure, especially on a day like today, Dr. King's birthday, to have an opportunity to speak about the gravity of this moment. I want to thank all of our press for being here. If America is to be free, then the most critical voice that we must acknowledge is the voice of a free press. It is so critical to a democracy that without it, the democracy begins to erode. Today, we are here because we stand shoulder to shoulder in support of all of the freedom fighters that have emerged in this quest for the American dream. They emerged from the shores from the very beginning, fighting for a reality that this society would grow and be very different than any society that had ever existed, the American ideal. However, there was irony in the American ideal. The irony of the American ideal simply stated that we request from our oppressors at that time, the British government, Freedom for all men. As a matter of fact, they went on to, to draft a document, a document that would be echoed by every country around the globe who desired to be free. And that simple freedom simply said that each and every man had the right to freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But as they were making those bold and true statements in cabins that weren't fit for human beings, there was these Africans. There were these Africans that had been brought over not for freedom, not for liberty, not for the pursuit of happiness. These Africans were to be brought over and to be made the burden of freedom, liberty, and justice. And the truth of the matter is, is they served that purpose well. They served that purpose well. They worked from sunup to sundown, from can't see at night to can't see during the day. They served that purpose well. But while serving that purpose, they were in the fields and they were screaming and singing in the fields. They were in their churches. They were in their small homes. And they cried for a day that their children would have opportunities that they currently didn't have. So they begin to fight. From 1619, they begin to fight. In 1812, they continue to fight. From 1860 to 1864, they continue to fight. During the time of lynching, they begin to fight. Through the Civil Rights Movement, they continue to fight. Through Black Liberation, they continue to fight. They were always fighting for liberty. They were always fighting for justice. They were always fighting for what every American except for them took for granted, which was the right for the pursuit of happiness. So in this time,
we found ourselves at another point of the fight. We just had another point of the fight. See, the fight didn't start in 1972 or 73 or 75 or 1980. The fight started long before then, and this is a continuation of that fight. So as we look at America right now, and we see in every imaginable state, there's a challenge against what our forefathers saw that we would have the opportunity to pursue justice. There's a challenge to squeeze this democracy and to deny justice. And there's a particular fight that has fell on the doorsteps of not only the America that we know, but also the America that had been persecuted. And that is the America that created unjustly a criminal justice system that was not justice, but was more criminal. And we know that from the, 19, the early 1970s up until this point, that the criminal justice system has unjustly grown from 400,000 people in 1975 to almost 3 million people right now with the majority of those people being people of African descent, being black and brown people, and even poor whites, but the majority of those people being African. We have to push forward. When Marilyn Mosby emerged on the steps of the War Memorial Building in Baltimore, Maryland, Baltimore City was on fire. And if she would not have stepped and made the statements that she made at that point, the Baltimore that we enjoy right now, we may be putting it back together, literally brick by brick. Because those children of those slaves were tired of getting pushed on by the criminal justice system. And we want the world to know that the black community and Americans throughout from California to Boston to Florida. They do not see this as an attack on Marilyn Mosby. They see this as an attack on justice, on freedom and equality. This is bigger than Marilyn Mosby. And we have a media that is gathered here today that has to ask some critical questions. Ask some very critical questions. Is, is this justice? Is this pursuit of Marilyn Mosby politically motivated? They must ask the question, are there questions around those who are choosing to prosecute Marilyn Mosby that maybe deserve an answer? The burden of the proof is not on Marilyn Mosby. The burden, on the, proof, the burden of proof is on America. The burden of, of proof is to decide what America will we live in. Will we live in the McCarthy era? We know that there's a history of when there's a shift or a desire for change, there's a rise for those who want to keep things the same. Do we want to live in the J. Edgar Hoover era when there was unjust and an unjust pursuit in particular, of black leaders so that the dream of Dr. King would not be filled, fulfilled. I'm simply saying to the press and to Americans is that we have to see this fight as something greater than what we are currently seeing it. But I'm here today to be the master of ceremony and to invite a few of my friends who not only stand with Marilyn Mosby, but they stand for America and they stand for justice. I would like to invite as our first person who will take us a little further in the program, a brother who's a true freedom fighter, not only for Baltimoreans and Colombians, but for the whole state of Maryland. He's the president of the state conference of the NAACP. Please welcome to the microphone, 
Willie Flowers. Good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, D. Chase. Um, thanks for the organizers for inviting me. And I think we can get right down to business because as he's explained, um, and I can answer the question, this entire thing is politically motivated um, by forces that are traditional in Baltimore City who attack elected leaders who are, who are working to do things in the community that's been piled on by the challenges of uh, restoration of a city, the idea of building a city, the idea of building a public education system that works um, for students of the city so they can be vibrant members of the community. And the, and the example of what it takes to create that image of a beautiful committee, a community is what you see with the Mosby family. You see a uh, mother and a father, a nuclear family. Not only are they a nuclear family with children in the, in the public school systems, a nuclear family that uh, made a decision intentionally to move in, into a community to help rebuild it, but they're also a family who both educated people who came back to, in the case of um, um, the president of the city council, Nick Mosby, came back to his hometown to help contribute in the same way that we all do and dream of um, how we can fix the community. Well, they, they actually pulled it off. Not only did he um, run, um, and he didn't win the first time for a city council, but he did not give up, came back and ran and um, became a member of the city council. He did not give up, but he brought his family along, his wife along, little children along to be a part of what he was trying to build um, for his hometown. And, and as it happens, his, his wife decided to run. But what she didn't know was that even before she got elected, that there were attacks on the um, sitting um, uh, uh, state's attorney when her husband was uh, first elected to office. The attacks on Patricia Jessamy are, uh, are well documented. Not only um, was she attacked and um, ridiculed as a state's attorney, but the sitting mayor who became the governor incentivized the role so that they could get the right person for them to run, only because Patricia Jessamy didn't manage the state's attorney office the way he wanted her to run it. And this is the same attack on Marilyn Mosby today in that she's not running the state's attorney's office the way those who want her to run it, to run it. So when she came down the stairs, as um, D. Chase explained, after the Freddie Gray murder um, in 2014, I think it was, everything shifted because she didn't have the shackles of any other entity on her legs to do what they wanted her to do. So when you do something like that, the attack becomes, as you saw it, um, the people in the media saw it, you reported on it, the attacks were on her credit, on, actually, before they went after her credibility, they went after her at the ballot. And when the ballot didn't work, um, this system of bullying was, uh, I guess, the policy at the time. When the ballot didn't work, they went after her credibility, the credibility of her family the credibility and audacity of her family to, to have um, basic business initiatives to help um, stabilize a family in a city um, with challenges. And that was, I guess, two years ago. That attack, while um, well publicized, and the announcement of, of an investigation that was triggered right here in the city, when that didn't work, we come to this, an attack farther on her credibility of her spending her own money, her making decisions about money that she earned, her making decisions about money that she has created through a public service job that she earned, when the other criticism was, was that she could not participate in a business initiative of her own making. So I guess in, 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 in common terms, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So now the scrutiny is on her making a decision about her savings and her own personal accounts so that she can build a future for her city while being attacked by a U.S. attorney and having to 
do something that nobody wants to do, and that's spend your savings, the little money that you have, on attorneys to combat a case on, when, you're, when both members of your family are under attack. And that's what we're left with. But the message here is to the community. Because they've done the, bu the bullying job, they've gone after the ballot, and they've attacked the business of this family. What we have to do as a community is to support them at the ballot box, support them during this period, to be stewards and to do for them what they have done for the community. And that's to be detailed in our support for them, to be detailed in our attitude toward um, squashing out all this negativity about what they do with their money. What a family does with their money is their business. What a family does with their money is their business. And I was so happy to hear her say, because this is duplicated throughout the history of attacks on our black leaders, from Dr. King to Malcolm X. When she said, I'm built for this, she wasn't just speaking for herself, she was speaking for the city of Baltimore. And the city of Baltimore is built for this. Not only are we built for it while we're under attack here, we also want to focus on next step for the ballot box. So I encourage everyone listening to this um, broadcast to be prepared to support Marilyn Mosby, to be support, to prepare to support the president of the city council, Nick Mosby, while they go through this, and to support and pray for this family. Support and pray for this family because it's extremely important and to pre be prepared once again to go to the ballot box to make sure that these attacks mean nothing, to make sure that the energy that you used the first time she was elected. And I'll tell you a personal story. I was driving along Cold Spring during that election year, and the only person I saw in a crowd of uh, supporters of her opponent was Nick Mosby, and he was there supporting his wife. He was there supporting his wife then. He supported his wife every time I spoken to him. He supported his wife during all of this, and because he supported her, I'm going to support him, and I'm going to support this family. And I want to thank, um, I want to thank them for allowing me to speak and to um, um, promote this effort, not just toward their support, but the support they need at the ballot box on this June. I want to um, invite to the stage Ms. Daphne, who has been working um, in the trenches with an organization called um, uh, Mothers of Murdered Sons and Daughters. She's a fighter at the grassroots level and has stimulated a, a huge conversation about what we must do as a community to support families who have had the challenge of having their children um, murdered in the city of Baltimore. I want to invite her up right now. Sorry, that's Willie Flowers, W-I-L-L-I-E-F-L-O-W-E-R-S. housekeeping is that uh, we had a change in order so I'll just give them all to you so that it will flow a little bit easier. Uh, Ms. Daphne Alston, Moms of Murdered Sons and Daughters is next and she will be followed by Reverend Dr. Kevin Slater, Slayton, S-L-A-Y-T-O-N of Northwood Appold United Methodist Church followed by Nicole Mundell from Out for Justice and then we will introduce A. Scott Bolden, who is the attorney for Marilyn Mosby, who will be able to speak with you guys about specifics of the case. And we're, we will um, go briefly, but steadfastly and forward with our speakers. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Daphne, come on up. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daphne Austin, a co-founder of Mothers of Murdered Sons and Daughters, United Incorporated. Today I stand from a long heritage of strong black women. From my grandmother to my great grandmother to my mom and to myself, very strong black women. I have a daughter named Shakira 
who's a very strong black woman. I have an adopted daughter, Marilyn Mosby, who's a strong black woman and also a strong friend. And I stand here today to say, out of all the prosecutors in the state of Maryland, from the counties to the waterways and the byways, Ms. Marilyn Mosby is the only person that meets with us mothers, come sit with us, share in our pain, and try to get work done so we can have our cases solved. Over 300 some homicides in Baltimore City a year and hundreds in the other counties altogether. And she's the only person who ever took the time to reach out to us and say that she's with us. So yes, I stand here today on behalf of Ms. Marilyn Mosby. I stand here strong and bold because Ms. Merlin is strong and bold. We will no longer as black women sit back and tolerate the way we are being treated in this country called America. We work hard in this country. We give of ourselves. We have taken care of everybody. We see about everybody's needs. And now it's our time. And we don't want anyone in our way. Today we say enough is enough. I couldn't imagine paying for college and sending my daughter to school and making sure that she has everything she needs and tell her she can dream big. You can become anything you want to be. You can become a mayor, state's attorney, a doctor, a lawyer, or anything. And she gets to her dream spot, and then there's all kind of obstacles in her way. I couldn't dream to stay in here and not do anything about it. And I'm encouraging the whole community, the whole state of Merle, the whole nation to join with us black women. We are wonderfully made, we are smart, we are blessed, and we're not stupid. We will no longer be hung by the trenches of anybody's injustices that come to us daily. We love, we love unconditionally. We love our children unconditionally. And we're saying today that no more, enough is enough. When you deal with Ms. Marilyn Mosby, you have to deal with all of us. And I don't think anyone's arms is strong enough to box with God or to box with us. So I'm asking you today to go down inside of yourself and in your hearts and find yourself a way to stand with Ms. Marilyn Mosby today not only as our state's attorney, but as a black mother and a black leader and a female. And we say today, get out of our way. No one can stop us. We are now unstoppable and unmoving. And have a good day. Next, I'll ask for Dr. Reverend Canyon Slater to come up, please. Good afternoon. I am... Uh, even though it doesn't look like it on my face, I'm excited to stand in support of our state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, and her family, her husband, Nick. We share something in common. That is, our feet have literally been tattooed by the soul that runs through Tuskegee, Alabama. So not only is she built for it, she's literally rooted and struggled. Fifty years ago, five decades, the Baltimore Sun reported 330 murders in Baltimore City. Just two weeks ago, the same paper reported 337 murders. Now, I know it would be very easy to blame this on one person, but this is a problem that is not on the hands of one person. It didn't start 10, 15 years ago. It's been here for a while. The problem is too many folks who are in a position to do something have been complicit because a lot of folks have benefited from the suffering and oppression of people who look like, who look like me and are of color. And along comes, as history always does, some black woman who got the courage to sit down and refuse to go along to get along. Over those 50 years, I imagine, I didn't do the data, that a number of African American homes that look like mine were literally turned upside down because of the strength, the foundations of their family were removed, the men, for selling something we call weed, marijuana back then, probably reefer. And now here we are in 2022, that same product will make millionaires out of white men and white women. 
And this little black woman had enough sense to say, I'm not going to send any more these folks to jail and upset houses and destroy communities at the expense of people who look like me. And so I showed up today, one, because I like them, but two, because I'm a preacher. And three, because it's the King holiday. And I don't want you to forget in all your reporting that you do today that Dr. King was many things. But first, he was a preacher. He was a preacher who was birthed out of the experience of the black church that believed that liberation and oppression and, 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 and the uplift of people who had been oppressed was something that we were all do. And so he spent his entire life doing what I came here to do today. That is to lead the march, to go and tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Let them go. Stop following, stop trying to find things on these people. Allow them to do their jobs. And then lastly, I would remind those folks who look like them in positions similar to theirs, the words of the great theologian Martin Niemöller, the German theologian who said famously, when they came for the socialists, I didn't say anything because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the Germans. I didn't say anything because I wasn't a German. But then they came for me. For those folks who wear black and brown skin who sit in these high offices, one day it could be you. Thank you, Rev. One day it could be you. That's a big statement. And I repeat the question, what is the America that we are going to live in? Are we going to live in the McCarthy era where Americans' lives were turned upside down on random witch hunts? Are we going to live in the era where the FBI began a program called COINTELPRO that disrupted black leadership to ensure that the successes that we are enjoying right now didn't happen. This is on our doorstep, America. This is not about Marilyn Mosby. But we appreciate her courage to stand and fight. Next, I would like to introduce a young woman who is literally fighting for justice every day. Uh, she's a friend of mine. She leads a lot of different efforts, but today she's here to support uh, our state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, Nicole Hansen Mundell. Again, my name is Nicole Hansen um, Mundell. Um, and thank you, uh, Derek, for so eloquently um, trying to categorize who I am and what I do. Um, what I do for many uh, people in Baltimore is I advocate for them, those individuals who find themselves on the opposite side of the law, those individuals um, who are um, in our communities, very disadvantaged, um, those individuals who do not have some of the same access um, as many of us have in this room. Um, and one of the things that we stand on, those of us who are in the legal community, um, those of us who may not be attorneys but practice and educate ourselves about the law, is that there is a presumption of innocence. Um, and just like many of us, Miss um, Mosby deserves that as well. Uh, one of my colleagues talked about um, staying out uh, of people's personal business. Um, this is not about uh, the fact that Miss Miss Mosby didn't do her job as a prosecutor. Uh, this is about the media and the public deciding to stick their nose in somebody's personal matters. Um, throughout my years working in advocacy, um, Ms. Mosby uh, uh, has done more in terms of standing on a presumption of innocence than many of her predecessors, right? 
um, she has been open uh, to advocating for laws and policies that seek to change the way uh, our bail system and our priest child system operates. Um, she was uh, one of the only prosecutors that I saw uh, during a global pandemic urging our governor uh, to release those individuals who charges will likely be dropped in the first place, who encouraged our governor um, to send resources here to Baltimore as opposed to uh, talking about how bad this city is. It was her that said, Governor, bring resources to the city. Ensure uh, that individuals have access. Um, it was this woman who brought herself to Annapolis um, on her own accord to ensure uh, that individuals who, who found themselves on the wrong end of the gun trace task force, that they would be uh, financially compensated for some of the, the ills that that gun trace task force um, bestowed on Baltimore residents. There are people still suffering today because of a group of law enforcement officers who decided um, that they would treat people any kind of way. And so because she decided that these individuals should be brought to justice, um, there are people who are making a decision that because she went against that status quo, that we're gonna show uh, her who we are. That's, that's essentially what they're saying. That because this woman decided to stand on the right side of justice, that they're gonna show her that that's not okay for, for, for black women to do. And so I just wanna make sure that the citizens of Baltimore uh, withhold your judgment because just like you deserve the presumption of innocence, so does she. And so um, I know that there are formerly incarcerated people across this city who have turned their lives around because let's be clear, this is not a woman who is um, uh, uh, just supporting people who break the law, right? She is supporting individuals who have made a decision to turn their lives around. And that is who she supports, right? So she's not a person who's just supporting any old criminal out here, no. She's supporting uh, individuals who have made some bad choices but decided to turn their lives around. One of the only prosecutors I know in the state that actually has a, a, a victim's integrity unit, right? That individuals, and I hope I'm saying the, 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 the name of the, um, the office, right? But she's willing, what's her name? Yes, yes, right? And um, also she's been a part of bringing individuals home who have served decades behind the walls because of unjust, uh, unjust legal system. The office is actually working. One of the only state's attorneys that I know who actually supports individuals, young people who find themselves um, on the opposite side of the law and gives them an opportunity to rebuild their lives because she know what they're facing out there in the streets of Baltimore. So, so again, let's make sure as the public, we withhold judgment and allow for the legal system to do uh, what the legal system does. And let's remember that she deserves the presumption of innocence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicole, and again, thank you, media, for being here. Um, our community needs heroes. We need someone to, who has the expertise, who has the experience, who has the, the relationships, to call injustice injustice, and then to put together a legal case to ensure that justice is indeed preserved. The gentleman who I have the pleasure of bringing before you 
has been called to this moment. And again, I'll tell you, the backdrop of this is, this is Dr. King. We're on Dr. King's holiday, and we're having a, a conversation about justice. We're having a conversation about freedom. We're having a conversation about equality. We're having a conversation about the American dream and those who are called to make sure it happens, such as a Marilyn Mosby. We are called to this on this day. But the gentleman who I'm calling before, now, before you now has the responsibility to make sure that Marilyn gets a fair shot. Let's welcome to the, to the microphone her attorney, her attorney, Attorney Bolden. Thank you. Good evening, or good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. That's right, absolutely. I want to thank all of our speakers who are here, who stand with Marilyn Mosby. If you are here and you stand with Marilyn Mosby, join me in saying, I stand with Marilyn Mosby. 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 One more time. I stand with Marilyn Mosby. Let me thank you all for being here today. This is a important time for the city of Baltimore. On behalf of Marilyn Mosby, I thank you for being here. Many of you ask me, how is Marilyn doing? She's a tough prosecutor herself. She's got a family. She's been through a lot this year. She's built for this, but she's also a humble public servant. Every day, she gets up to serve the people for the state of Baltimore and for the city of Baltimore. I don't want you to forget that. She is the chief law enforcement officer for the city of Baltimore, a state elected official who's being charged four months before her re-election campaign, four months before her re-election campaign to affect and in effect the result of that campaign. Let's not be confused about it. Let's not be confused about it. I've been on this journey with Marilyn and her family for several months, over a year. This case started as a criminal tax investigation. The government put that in writing, if you will. They teamed up with the State Bar Association Disciplinary Board because she wouldn't give, her, give the State Board, she wouldn't give them backup to her 2019 and 2020 20 tax returns. And by the way, the 2020 tax returns had not been filed. She didn't have to give those up. And so the U.S. Attorney's Office for Maryland went to them, talked with them, and then began a criminal tax investigation investigating her taxes. I'm going to talk about animus in a minute, but everything I tell you today ties into the animus. They opened up a criminal tax investigation simply because she would not produce backup to an agency that did not deserve them legally. They then investigated not only campaign finance, they went to her babysitters, they went to her hairdressers, they went to her friends, they went to churches challenging charitable contributions. Listen to me. I'm going to talk about animus in a minute. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars gratuitously investigating a sitting public servant who filed their taxes and went line by line regarding charitable contributions. Who does that? Who does that? Marilyn Mosby stands today as an innocent person. I don't care whether she's been indicted or not. She is an innocent person. And she is not a convicted person, public, private, or judicially. Marilyn Mosby is innocent as we stand here with these community leaders. They then referred the criminal tax case to DOJ to get approval for it. 
and that's the first time we saw the, recommenda the recommendations for charges. One of the recommendations in regard to her tax returns were for her tax year 2020 returns, right? This was in 2021, except one problem. She hadn't even filed her taxes for tax year 2020, and they were alleging a loss or a subject amount of money of $4,000 or $12,000, and she hadn't even filed her taxes yet. I'm going to talk about animus in a minute. They did ask, and they did also on their recommendation sheet to DOJ, they talked about perjury. And I'm going to talk about due process in a minute. They recommended a charge for perjury. At the one meeting we had with DOJ that's allowed under the law, we asked them a simple question. My warrior lawyer friend, where's my warrior lawyer? Right here. Right here. We asked them, we said, well, what's the statement? You know, if you got perjury under the law, you got to have a statement. So tell us the statement. You can't prosecute my client for perjury and give her due process and some reasonableness and fairness. And eight prosecutors sat in that meeting with us and refused to tell us the statement upon which she was accused of lying about. How can that be? This is a sitting publicly elected official and they're accusing her of perjury now, false statements now, and I can tell you all four charges are false. I can tell you we have exculpatory evidence that we wanted to share with them, did share with them. We offered her up to the grand jury. We offered her up to be interviewed. But when you're not interested in justice and fairness and equity, you don't take those meetings. You ignore the numerous emails. You probably don't read the defense memorandum because you want a conviction and an indictment at all costs, not because you think she's guilty. Oh no, that's too hard under the law. You do that because you want to affect the reelection four or five months out while she's in full campaign mode and have two opponents. That brings me to Leo Wise. He's so special. He's so special. In the last election, the lead prosecutor, the driver of the narrative, negative narrative, he gives not once but twice to her opponents four years ago. Sees nothing wrong with that, right? The prior beef between them and the gun trace and who's leaking and what, they beefed before. He then gives two contributions, not one. We go to DOJ, Office of Professional Responsibility, and we say this needs to be investigated. He needs to be removed from the case, and it needs to be an internal investigation on why, how, who, and what drove this investigation of Marilyn Mosby. We know it started during the Trump campaign or during the Trump uh, leadership. We know that Donald Trump called for her to be prosecuted. We know his AG singled her out before a police conference about her job and being a progressive, liberal prosecutor who does her job, but not like the conservatives or the status quo, bringing some equity to how you prosecute crimes, right? Because black people and brown people are significantly um, affected negatively by the old way, by the conservative way, by the black versus white way, right? Absolutely. So we're gonna, she's going to change that narrative. She's going to stop prosecuting prostitutes. She's going to stop prosecuting low-level drug offenses. And the numbers in this city, despite what you hear and read and what you all write, those numbers are down. And that's not me saying that. That's the reports from the, from the college reported at John Hopkins. And so no one would investigate Leo Wise. There was a new attorney, new U.S. attorney, Eric Barron. We asked him to investigate. We gave him everything and said, give us a meeting. Refused to meet with us. We offered her up for a grand jury, an interview. Refused to even respond. These are the forces. These are the dark forces 
that we are up against. These are facts, too. This isn't some conjecture by some criminal defense lawyer because of the rantings of a criminal defense lawyer. These are facts. There are documents to support this. And so my client has been through a lot. Legal fees, uh, friendships affected, uh, uh, her inability to give 100% to serve in the residence because it's either the state ethics boards or it's, it's the Bar Association or it's a U.S. Attorney's Office. And by the way, she's not driving this negative narrative, right? Those agencies are. And we know that goes back to her choice to prosecute police officers in regard to Freddie Gray. I don't care what the outcome was. There's some cases, I'm a former prosecutor, there's some cases where cases have to be tried and done. Justice has to be served. And so when you talk about racial animus in this case, we know that Leo Wise, based on published reports, you know, served in the Office of Congressional Ethics and targeted Congressional Black Caucus members. He left there, and his newest target, his newest target is Marilyn Mosby. We know there's personal animus because of personal beefs about turf and the gun tracer piece between them. And then there's political animus, the contributions that were given. And the political animus is that he and others in the law enforcement community certainly don't want her to get another term. Where well, I'm here to tell you, Marilyn Mosby is not going to be the only one on trial. And we want a quick trial. We want, we're ready to go. The quickest is 70 days, right? Elections five months away. Others believe that it'll go six months or a year. Oh, we're pushing for trial in 70 days, right? Because we don't want this to affect the political outcome of this race. And so we're going to try to get a trial as soon as possible. But Marilyn Mosby is not the only one that's going to be on trial. The U.S. Attorney's Office for Maryland is going to be on trial. The criminal justice system and its attacks on black female progressive prosecutors is going to be on trial. The whole system in Baltimore and how you go after black elected officials, black female elected officials, black liberal prosecutors all around this country, it's going to be on trial when we get there. We're going to do our best to get answers and truth and justice, not only for Marilyn Mosby, but for the citizens of Baltimore and Maryland and this criminal justice system and the prosecutors that drive the negative narrative towards black and brown people and black female progressive prosecutors. You can bank on it. And so I'm here to thank you all for standing with us, for standing with this fight. Because we just begun. You know, usually I'm pretty nat Natalie clad. But these are my fighting. This is my fighting wardrobe. I know, you look good, man. You know, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fighting. I, I'm, we're about to do a fight. And so this is what we got to do. And so uh, I hope that those who are listening, I hope that those who are standing behind me, and I hope that those who believe in a fair criminal justice system who believe in Marilyn Mosby, right? And even those that may have questions, we want you to stand with us, support us, because in the end, she is innocent until proven guilty. And the criminal justice system and the prosecutions that have wrongfully brought this case against her, they will be on trial as well. Thank you. Was she ill-advised by whom? No, no, it was her money, one. And two, she certainly got advice from professionals, right? And three, if you weren't negatively affected financially, one way or the other, directly or indirectly by COVID, right? If you weren't affected, raise your hand. If you weren't affected. If you were not affected by COVID financially, whether you kept your job or not, raise your hand. That is not true. This was not PPP. This was 401k. Hold on. This is relief from her 401k, not public funds. I, 
I'm not going to get into the specifics of that. I'm telling you, she's not only innocent, but we have professionals who she consulted with, and she qualifies on one of those on, under the statute. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to get into a swearing match about that. I'm telling you that she qualified for those monies and she was advised on those monies. And I'm not going to get into a tat tat of what's been said before, done, and what have you. I don't know what you mean by operational. There were other businesses involved. In fact, in fact, the U.S. Attorney, the U.S. Attorney was investigating those other businesses. So they had to be operational. I don't know how you define operational. I'm telling you those businesses were, were, were running and they were being pursued and they were legally on the books. Next, Next question. question. I have no idea, but I will tell you this, whether more indictments come or not, our position is the same. And we certainly uh, battled the government, the federal government, in regard to any tax implications, and I can't comment any further on that. But our position won't change. Well, they, those are mutually exclusive issues. These are businesses were a startup, okay? And as a result, that does not disqualify her along with some other facts that we have to present that would certainly absolve her of any wrongdoing here. Next. Yep. Well, I would tell them to keep the faith, to be strong, that public leadership is not for the, the weary or those who want rest, to protect yourself at all times. And even then, when there are forces, darker forces, working against you because of your integrity and you making tough decisions, going against the grain, going against the establishment, unfortunately, not just here in Baltimore, but elsewhere, elsewhere can bring you legal scrutiny that will change your life for the rest of for the rest of your life unfortunately you got to be careful and even then it's not safe Well, certainly arrests have to be made. I, see, I keep, you, you all, I keep reading how somehow she's blamed for homicides in this country, or rather in, in Baltimore. She is the only blame or responsibility when someone is arrested to bring them, uh, bring justice to them, and that is to prosecute them, right? And so I don't put the murder rate in her bailiwick. I put that in when people are arrested and good investigators do their work and they bring them and then they get prosecuted, right? And so I have every confidence and I can tell the public every constant confidence she is going to completely and continue to do her job. That's one thing. And we're going to be able, the lawyers are going to do what the lawyers have to do on the defense side. And that's really not a balancing act. That just comes with being Marilyn Mosby. Yeah. 
I'm not going to I'm not going to dignify your last comment. Let me just say this: um, um, I looked for the tax lien myself. Could not find it. That I know you do. You know how we found it? We got it from the press. I don't know where you got it from. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you where you got it from, but we, but we certainly didn't get it. My clients didn't get it, and it wasn't delivered or to them in the normal way, if you will. I don't know about all these other additional letters, but as I've said before and I've said in writing, my client did not know about the tax liens until later, but that's irrelevant because right now the indictments are, the indictments don't cover any criminal tax charges. My only point is, she did not know, she did not lie, and that'll come out at trial. I think that's it, right? That's it. All right, thank you. Any additional questions, everybody? Mm -hmm. Really quickly, number one, thank you. Thank you to everyone standing behind me, in front of me. Particular thank you to A. Scott Bolden. Really quickly, for those who are watching, especially on our live feeds, for those who are here in the media, who want to present a balanced report, there are ways that you can support, that you can square this out. We want everyone to share this press conference today, if you can. Like, share, do whatever you need to do. We also need everybody to vote. Yeah. Go vote. The future of our city depends on everybody out there making their voice heard and voting. Register today.